Turn with me, if you would, to the book of uh, the 15th chapter of the book of Luke. If you would, the 15th chapter of the book of Luke. And let's all stand as we honor God's word by standing. And I'm going to begin reading uh, in a, uh, at the 11th verse. <clears throat> now, um, the title of my message today, and I, I want to put it in this phrase, two lost sons. Now, as I read this, you're going to see that this father that everybody uh, believes is, represents God, and I do too, but this father had two lost sons. He didn't have just one, he had two, and you're going to read that in just a moment, or we will. Uh, in verse 11, he says, and he said, a certain man had two sons. Now, there it is. A certain man had two sons, not just one. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in, in the land. And he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a, citizens, to a citizen of the country. And he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, there's an important statement, when he came to himself, think about when you came to yourself, and he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And am, no and, am no, and am no worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to the, his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and, and, uh, and the ring, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted ca calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. That's another important statement. My son is dead and is alive again. He was, he was lost and is found. Another important statement. And they began to be merry. And the elder son, this is the other son. And the elder son was in the field. And, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and ask what these things means. And he said unto him, Thy brother is, is come, and, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in, and therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to my, his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time. Now, what does that sound like? That sounds like the Pharisee. Neither have I transgressed any time thy commandment, and yet thou never uh, gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as, uh, but as, soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living, 
and, and harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatty calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was, it was meet that we should make merry and be glad for his for this thy brother was dead, another important statement, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. Thank you for the blessings of it. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for everything, Lord. And, and again, Lord, I, I pray that uh, you'll send something to, if that's what it takes, to burn out this terrible diseases that we have. We're thankful that we can meet. We're thankful that no one is bothering us as of right now. And, Lord, I'm thankful that we can come together here at Landmark Baptist Church. And I'm so thankful, Father, that, that we, can, uh, we can do these things. I pray, Lord, for each one that's here. I pray, Lord, that you'll see fit to protect them while they're here. And, Lord, I pray that in all things that you might be honored and glorified in everything that we do today. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Two lost sons. Now, there's no doubt that in most people's eyes that the, the oldest son was lost because he uh, he truly uh, um, was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee of the family, and so uh, he was the one that said he hadn't done anything wrong. And the father had no, no use to take someone in that had, done, had sinned terribly and, and bring them in and, and have this rejoicing for them. Now, it is so easy to see the three parables before us today. Now, there, there's three parables that are said in this chapter. The, the parable, uh, parables before us today, we see the lost sheep. And which is nobody has any complaint about that. We know that that lost sheep was was saved when he was found. We have the lost coin, and we know that that coin was referred to as being lost. And there was nothing done until that coin was found, and we we read that. You read that and see that. And then we have uh, so what some want to believe a backslidden son. That wasn't the case, and I and I don't and I won't say this and probably say it again. I won't argue with anyone who wants to believe that this was a backslidden son, but it, it doesn't match the three uh, the three group the group of three that we see in this chapter: lost sheep, lost coin, and also lost son. So that's that's something that we need to realize. Why is this so? I'm sorry, my personal belief is the son was lost. Why? For the father had another son who all would say was lost, for he was a picture of the Pharisees who also had a relationship with the father, who all believed, uh, and all believed that the father represented God. It seems if one believes he represents God, <clears throat> That is, if one believes that he represents God, and I believe he does. Some seem to think that God was holding uh, one son higher than the other. And that's, that's what it seemed like uh, here, that he was holding one son higher than the other. We all know this is not so with God, the Father. We are sons, and there are those, but there are those out there that are not sons, though they say they represent God. If you remember one time in the scriptures, the disciples came to Jesus, and they, they told Jesus, they said, they're up there on the mountain, they're up there on the hill, and, and they're uh, casting out demons in your name. And what did, what did Jesus, I've got a fly that's bothering me, what did Jesus uh, uh, say to them? Jesus said, are they for me or are they against me? Now, let me tell you, folks, anybody that, that wants to 
represent God or anybody that wants to worship God can worship God. I don't care if you lost or saved. You know, many times in church services we have lost people, but they still worship the Lord. And, and they still say, some of them still say that, uh, that they are, and I'm not talking about necessarily those here, but there are some who still say, well, I'm, I'm a child of God because I worship God. Well, in, in essence, the demons worship God. You know, you got to remember that. And the Bible says the demons worship God, and they feared, and they were afraid. So we know that uh, a lot of people worship God under uh, fear. A lot of people, the Pharisees worship God under fear because the Pharisees felt they, they were legalistic people. They felt that if they'd done anything wrong, that they were going to go to hell. So they tried their best to, to do everything right. They, they went to the synagogue every time the doors was open. They went, they, they put... They put their tithes and their offerings in, every opportunity they had. They prayed. They stood through it on the street corners, and they prayed, and, and they, wore their, they wore their long robes, and, and they, like a, uh, like a diocese or something, they wore their long robes, and they represented God. But yet we know we wouldn't know it, except the Lord told us in his word they're lost. They're lost. They're dying and going to hell. Because so Jesus told him in Matthew 23, he told him, he said, uh, he said, uh, he said that you, you go, you're proselyting people and you're going out and you're proselyting them and you make them two, third, two, two times more the, the uh, occupants of hell than you, uh, greater damnation than even yourself. Well, let me tell you, folks, we, we got to get this in our heads that there are some people who worship God who are not saved. They're just not saved. You know, we got to get that in our head. We got to get in our head that just because somebody says that they're saved, that doesn't necessarily mean they are. And we'll, we'll get into this more, a little deeper in just a few minutes. But listen, uh, we, we got to realize that. We've got to know that. And we've got to know that this man, this man, this father, who we say represents God, and I believe he does, had two sons. Now, he had two sons. Now, if you believe this first son was already saved, then you have to believe the second son was saved too because he was, a, he, 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 he was called a son of God. And, and certainly uh, the Pharisees, the Pharisees even told Jesus, they told Jesus themselves. They said, we're not, we're not born of fornication. Said said said, we're... He said, we're, we're born right, and, and, and we, we, we were brought up right, and, and we, were, we worshiped right, and we did everything right. And Jesus had to tell them, he had to tell them, he had to tell them, he said, you're of your father, the devil. He said, God is not your father. And so we've got to realize those things. We've got to see those things. And when we, get, when we look at this two lost sons here, then we'll find what, what, just exactly what happened to them. We all know it is not so with God, the Father, that, that he will hold any son in higher esteem than the other. God would not do it. God, God would not hold the son that came to him, that was, was with him and left and, and became lost, and, and that is lost to him, and came back. He wouldn't have held, he wouldn't have held him, he wouldn't have held him any higher than if the son, the second son, was already saved and, and did not leave. God wouldn't hold him any higher, and that's why that, uh, that, that's something that uh, we know that God would not do. God would not hold one son higher than the other, just like uh, uh, you and me. God is not going to hold any one son in here higher than the other one. God's not going to hold me any higher than he holds you. God's not going to hold you any higher than he holds me. And so you have to realize that. You have to see that and understand that. <clears throat> the psalmist, the Bible, as a matter of fact, the Bible says, well, let me say this. We are sons, and there are those who are not sons. 
God loves his sons and according to the psalmist, hates all workers of iniquity. That's found in, in, in Psalms uh, um, 4, I believe, it, I believe it's Psalms 4 and verse 1, 5 and verse 1, one of those. And, and he, he says he hates the workers, all workers of iniquity. That's what the psalmist said. David, the psalmist said that. And if you believe anything David said, you have to believe that. That uh, that that he he's a, he hates the workers of all workers of iniquity. The psalmist says in, in Psalms five and verse five. Here's where it is. The, the the foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. So when 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 the, when God when the second son the older son came in and he was upset he was angry because God was holding this son in higher than he was but what he did not know and as far as what I teach what he did not know was that this son had been saved and he wasn't what he did not understand and did not know yes God holds his his true sons higher than he does his fake sons God holds them in a lot higher esteem than he does his fake sons in that thus we know that God hates sin, and the other son was a great lost sinner. This was a, there was a lot of, there are a lot of lost sinners who try and connect themselves to God as the Pharisee did. If you went up to a Pharisee, if, they, one, of them, if one of them was here today, just like if you go up to a legalist, you go up to legalists today and you say, you know, uh, well, you know, you, you're, not, you're not a child of God. They're going to get mad. They're going to get angry, just like this son did. This son got angry when God didn't hold him as high as esteem as he did the other son. He got so angry about it. Let me quote a poem. I don't know who wrote it, but it's, it pretty much, uh, pretty much brings out what uh, he said. The poem says, alas... How I have served the devil, still lusting after all things evil. For my God, I saw the light. For, for O oh my God, I saw the light, yet plunged into the foulest night. Now, what's he talking about there? What, what's he talking about when he says the foulest night? He's referring to hell. He's referring to hell. He said, I, I was a sinner. And he said, uh, uh, it, it was God that showed me. And, and God that sent me plunged me into the phallus uh, of night. And so uh, that, that's, that's right there, you know. It takes God to show us that we're lost. It takes God to show us what we need. I, I can sit up here all day long and I can preach to you what we need and what we need and what we need, but I can't do anything about it. It takes God to do that. It takes God to save a sinner. It takes God to, to bring a sinner back where he belongs. It takes God to do that. So, so let's, let's, let's take, take a look at the characteristic of the lost son, the one that came back. First of all, he had a selfish demand. He had a selfish demand. How, how many people today have selfish demands of God? God, if you'll do this, then I'll do this. God, if you'll, if you'll just take care of me here, I'll take care of everything else. God, if you'll, just, if you'll just take care of part of my life, I'll take care of the rest of my life. How many people try to bargain with God? Sure they do. They try to bargain with God. God, if you'll do this, then I'll do that. That's, that's not the way it's done. He had a selfish demand. This is... This is like a lot of us. Many want all the blessings that the Father can give that they might be used to their own good and their own gratification. Oh, yeah, we, we love it. You know, did you know every one of you wouldn't have a job if God didn't give you one? Every one of you in here, every one of you. Now, listen to me, this whole message now. Do you know that you would not have a job if God didn't give you one. I know there's a lot of people that are out of work right now, but they're getting money. 
If, if you're on, right now, if you're on, uh, um, um, on, on uh, when you get you lose your job, I done lost the name. What? Unemployment. And unemployment. Did you know you're getting unemployment and $600 on top of that? Now, who can't live on that? You see, whatever we have, God gives it to us. If, 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 God, if, God, if God wants us to have a, a mansion on a hilltop, he'll give it to us. But matter of fact, he, he's going to give us, every one of us that are saved, a mansion. But God would give us one now if he wanted us to have it. God, God, you, you got to believe that. You got to understand that. This was a selfish demand. He said, I want all my money so I can go out and do what I want to. I want everything that is coming to me. I want all of my inheritance, and I want you to give it to me so I can go out and use it how I want to. And he did. He did. He did. This is like a lot of us have said. He had no regard for his father's wisdom and feelings. None whatsoever. No lost man has any regard for God's wisdom and his feelings. He'll sin against God. He doesn't care what God thinks about it. He even cursed God. You know, how many people curse God every day? GD, they're cursing God. Anytime they use God's name in vain, they're cursing God. And they don't, it doesn't bother them at all. You can preach it to them. You can tell them. You can see these things. And it doesn't bother them at all. They just go on doing what they're doing. Well, that's the way this son was. He was just like that. He, he, did, he, he had no regard for the wisdom and the feelings of God. And it is dishonoring to God for any to seek to manage their own lives at the expense of of a thrice holy God. God never, God never told us to do that. He never, he never told us to, to take advantage of what God gives us. Matter of fact, he, he teaches us that we should be thanking God every day for what we have, and we shouldn't be out there riotous living, doing things that we shouldn't be doing uh, as a result of, uh, of uh, uh, because he does, he does watch out after us, God watches out after lost people. He sure does. He, all he have to do is just lift his presence from them and, and in view of them, and they'd all head go to hell. Because that's what's going to happen. When they go to hell, the presence of God is not going to be there. God, the presence of God is not going to be in hell. God's not going to be in hell. He's not going to be there. And, and, and that's, that's one of the great... Uh, Judgments of hell. Secondly, he wanted to go on a wayward journey. He said he wanted to go to a far country. He said, I want, I want to get out of here. I want to go to a far country. I want to go to a far country. Well, a far country represents the condition of the world where there is absolutely no respect for God. That's where, that's where a far country takes. Who else said they wanted to go to a far country. Lot said it. Lot said, though Lot, now Lot was saved, but he still wanted to go to a far country. Where did it lead him? It, lead, it led him to Sodom, and there, there he, took, he took part in what was taking place in the world. But what's the difference today? What's the difference today if someone goes out there and takes part in what's going on in the world? We know what's wrong and what's right. If you don't know, then you have had your head in the sand for the last many years. You know what's wrong and what's right out there in the world. You, you know that. You, 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 know, you know what's wrong and what's right in churches. You know that. And, 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 and people know that. And this son, this, this son knew that. This son knew that. A true son of God would have to get into an awful state of sin when he feels there is no more pleasure in a godless, in a godless world than staying where God is blessing every day. Why would anybody, just like the lady told me one time, she said, I haven't, I, we, we were talking about eternal security. She, she was a woman preacher, and she didn't believe in it. She didn't believe in eternal security. And so I, I visit with her, 
And she asked me to come visit her, and I did. She was going to set me straight. And she asked me to come and visit her, and I did. And, and, and she told me, uh, she told me, she said, uh, I haven't sinned in, in, in 26 years. Well, let me tell you, folks, that's, that's but, but yet she preached untruth. She preached so much untruth, it was terrible. She preached that you could work your way to heaven. That's untruth. She preached those things. She preached those things. She pastored a church there in Cynthiana, Kentucky. And she preached those things. She preached, you know, that you can work your way, you can work your way to heaven. We know that's not right. And we know the things that the world does is not right. We know this. This upholds, this, and I'm going to say this, uh, this upholds that this son may have been backslidden. That's where people get this from. This is where they get this from, that he may have been backslidden. And that it is, and, and that is the reason, that is the reason I don't agree with any who believe it, but that's the reason that I don't argue with them either over it. I don't argue with anybody over that. If you, if you believe that this son was backslidden, uh, then, uh, then I'm not going to argue with you over it because there's some, there's some statements in here that gives credence to that, that there's a possibility that he was backslidden. But there's far more statements in here plainly says, my son was lost, but now he's found. My son was, was, was lost, but now he's saved. There's too, too, many, too many statements in here referring to that. Thirdly, he lived a reckless life. In verse 13, he lived a reckless life. He, like, like all lost people, think that sweet fellowship with the Father is of no value to them. They don't think, they don't think fellowship with the Father is any value to them. What about lost people in a church? They don't think the fellowship with you, us in here today, is worth it. Or they'd be here. They, they, they'd break the door down to get here. I'm telling you, they would. I'm, I'm thankful for those of you that came. But I'm, I'm going to tell you, folks, let me tell you, if people believed that being with God is greater than being out there in the world and, or, or being in some church somewhere where they teach uh, false doctrine and false teachings is better than, than being in the presence of God, then there's something wrong there. He lived a reckless life. He, he traded a good life for a righteous lifestyle. No person can keep, can keep the, um, I'm sorry, no person can keep the perceived peace, joy of a false salvation, which they have deep down, which they have a deep down need to sin against the thrice holy God. No one. When you, when, when you have a deep down need, you know, you know you do something wrong. Karen knows what we call it, presumptuous sinning. When you have a deep down need that you feel that you need to do something else, besides serve the Lord for a little while, then, uh, then, you, you don't, uh, then you don't believe that it's important. Oh, I can get backslid and have a man tell me one time. He said, preacher, I can get backslid and all I got to do is come back to church and y'all have to forgive me. What, what kind of, per what, what is that? When someone says that, and I, I asked him, I said, why did you say that? He said, because, he said, the Bible says, if I come back 49 times, you have to forgive me. 49 times. So wh what is it to getting backslidden? It doesn't mean anything when you feel you can come back. A person can stay out, stay out. Like a man told me one time, Brother Kendall and I, Man told Brother Kendall and I, he said, I've been backslidden for 47 years. Right over in Wheeler County. He said, I've been backslidden for 47 years. And I just, I politely, gently, and with all the love I can, I told him, I said, Brother, I just don't believe that. I don't believe a man can stay backslidden for 47 years. Because we know that God will bring a saved person back. We know that. 
we know God will bring them back. And so if you believe that this son was backslidden, and you're right, we, we do believe that God will bring them back. I believe that too, but I'm going to bring, I've got more to this message than, than what, I've, what I've preached. Thirdly, he found himself miserable. Found himself miserable. Oh, he found himself miserable. Every time I think about someone being miserable, I think of old Bailey sitting back there. When old Bailey got up and came forward, what was it? Bailey said, I can't stand it no longer. He said, I got to go. I thought about that, Bailey. That's what he said. Some of you wasn't here, but that's what he said when he got up. Wasn't that what he said, Neil? He said, I can't stand it no longer. But I'm going to tell you, there, was a, there came a time when I couldn't stand it no longer either. I couldn't stand it no longer either. So uh, he found himself miserable. He found himself miserable. Listen, folks, we are in a mighty plague, a plague which Jesus spoke to, spoke of to his church. We're in a mighty plague today. Now, I, I, I want you to think about this. You may say, well, you don't know what you're talking about. I may not be. There's a, lot, there's a lot of times I want to even question myself sometimes. I'm, I, I'm getting so stupid that I even question myself sometimes. But I'm going to tell you, folks, I'm going to tell you something here. Turn with me to Matthew 24, and I'll show you what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Back in, back in Matthew 24 and, and beginning in verse 7, Matthew 24 and verse 7, he says, For nation shall rise up against nation, and that's happening, and kingdom against kingdom, that's happening, and there shall be famines, that's also happening. Did you know, did you know that several million people starve to, death, starve to death every year in Africa and places like that? Several million of them do. They starve to death. Little kids, mothers, daddies, they starve to death. They starve to death every year. Have any, any of you starved to death? No. If you're saved today, God's going to see that you're fed. Yeah. Any of you starved to death? No, you haven't. No, you have not. He said that he shall send famines and pestilence. What do you think that word pestilence means? That's all sort of diseases. All kinds of diseases God's going to send. So let's don't sit here and think about that this is something that just happened. Listen, folks, God sent it. God sent it. God sent it. As I said Wednesday night, the world got angry with God. Now God's angry with the world. I had someone call me up this week, and they said, I appreciate that statement you made. Yes, God, the world is angry with God, and now God's angry with the world. And so you need to see that. He's going to send plagues, pestilence, and earthquakes in diverse places. Did you know they had an earthquake in Kentucky this week? In Kentucky. They had an earthquake this week in southern Kentucky. They had an earthquake this week. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Oh, don't tell me, Lord. Don't, don't, don't tell me about sorrows, Lord, because I'm telling you, I've been running from this plague for a while. I've been putting on masks. I've been going everywhere. I go in the grocery store, and I, die, and I have to dodge them little old gray balls. Yeah. You're talking about sorrow. How, how would I love to be able to walk in Walmart store and not be concerned about somebody in there may coughing on me? There's some that it don't concern them. But it does me. Brother Sam and I have got a lot to lose. Our lives. The doctor said the other day one of the greatest underlying things a person has is that they're fat. He saw he called it obese, I called it fat. 
Let me tell you, folks, yes, sorrows come. All this brings sorrows. And some of you have been blessed. You haven't had a family member that's gotten it yet or a close family member. I haven't either. I've got two daughters I pray for every day. Every morning I pray for them as they go out. I called Becky up and I said, Becky, are you going to wear your mask today? There was a time when she told me no, but I think you do now. Do you, Shelly? You do too? No. No, you don't. That's the reason I pray for you. I knew you didn't before I even asked you. I mentioned to Shelly one time, and she said, we don't have anybody in jail that's got it. You don't know about that next person that comes in jail. But let me tell you, folks, yes, this time comes. Days of sorrow, the beginning of sorrow. Verse 9, then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. You and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. What about the fellow that, that he got tested? He had it. He had symptoms of it. And they put him in quarantine. The first, the first day he was in quarantine, he came out of it and went to a big meeting at a church in Midway, in Georgia. Now, now all of those people that were there that day, all those people that they were meeting in the church in, in that day, that's been, that's been about a month ago, a week ago, I guess, a couple of weeks ago. All of them's got to be tested now. Well, what does he do? He leaves there, and he goes to Jessup, Georgia, and he goes to a funeral down there where there was a bunch of people conjugated. And, and, and after that, he went to the church where, the people, where they invited people to come and eat. He went there and ate with them. Shelly, you know where he is right now? He's in jail. Let me tell you, folks, these people out there don't care. They don't care whether you get it or not. These people out there don't care whether you get it or not. Well, I care whether you get it, just to be sound about it. A plague before the coming of the Lord is something that a man, I, told, I mentioned this Wednesday night, a man wrote about many, many years ago in a book. He said there's going to be a great plague that's going to come, and it's going to be all over the whole world, and it's going to be before the, before the Lord comes back. And now some, some fellow has written a book about, about that book, and you can buy it now, I guess, off the shelf. Fourthly, he found himself in a hog pen, not knowing what to do. He went and found a job, which sent him right to the hog pen. How many things we try before we realize what we really need. How many things we try? We try, well, if I just lose some weight. Brother Sam, me and you just lose some weight, we'll be okay. We won't we'll never be okay, will we? <laughs> we just lose some weight, we'll be okay. How many people have tried everything? They try going to church. Well, that lasts a little while. They try reading their Bible. That lasts a little while. Many things they try before they ever come to the realization of what their need is. I know people who have started going to a, go into a religious organization and spend a long time trying to convince themselves that their soul is all right.
but can never find peace in their life. Never find peace. Never find any peace. Let's, let's look for something else. I, I'm not happy here. Preacher, I'm not happy here at Landmark Baptist Church. But I'm going to go find something else. Never find any peace. They go here from here, there to there. Never find any peace. As one said to me many years ago, I would give everything I have just to have peace. Let me tell all today, if you are looking for true peace which passes understanding, look no further today. Look to Jesus, who is a giver of eternal peace. He gives eternal peace. You know, I pray every night before when I go to bed, Lord, give me peaceful sleep. I don't want to dream a bunch of stupid dreams. And so far, the Lord gives me a peaceful sleep. Now, I've had a time or two that I've had a dream. But Sam, I dreamed the other night that I was back in the military. You ever dream those? You don't dream them? Oh, my goodness. That CPAC must be the thing. <laughs> but let me tell you, I did. I dreamed I was right back in the military. And I woke up and I said, thank God I'm not back in the military. <laughs> and lastly, what happened to him? What happened to him? What eventually happened to him? Now listen to me. What happened to him? He heard that still, small voice. He heard that still, small voice. The Bible says when he came to his senses. The only time you're going to come to your senses is when you hear that still, small voice. Whether you're, whether you're backslidden or whether you're lost, it's that still, small voice that you must hear in order to get your life straightened out. Oh, I'm going to straighten my own life out. you got to hear that still, small voice. Oh, I'm going to get saved. One of these days I'm going to get saved when you hear that still, small voice. That still, small voice is what brings you to being born again. When he came to his census, it was approximately 15 years of sin on top of sin, but I eventually heard that still, small voice, March 17, 1967. Yeah, I heard that still, small voice. I can sit here today and tell you that still, small voice was speaking to me. On that Friday that the Lord saved me, that still, small voice, it just it, it bothered me all day long. All day long that day, March the 27th, all day long, it, it's just that still, small voice telling me what I needed, telling me what I needed. God showed me and he, had, and he also shows me today that there was far more, that there's far more by being in the father's household than running around in the world trying to make friends of the world. There's far more in the father's house. Far more in the father's house. You know, there's far more here than you'll ever find in Florida, the beach. Far more here than you'll ever find the mountains far more here I, I know what the mountains look like so I don't have to go there far more here than anywhere you can go there's far more right here today right here right this minute right this second there's far more here you thank God you thank God is not here well if he's not here why are all of you just quiet and listening I don't see a soul talking to one another uh, we preachers, we're, we're very observant. There's far more here than they would be. In, what if you were somewhere else? You'd be running around, carrying on, going on, jumping up and down, everything. No, you're sitting still, and you're looking at what God can do. That's all Moses said. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still and see it. Be quiet. And you are. You're quiet today. What a great blessing that is. May we 
may he show someone here today that there is love, peace, and joy being in the Father's family. May he show you today. All right, let's all stand and let's be dismissed.